Right, so good morning everyone. Um, welcome to today's Equality, Diversity, Inclusion webinar on race and ethnicity. We're very thankful that you're able to join us this morning. Uh, my name is James Swanson and I'm here as a representative of the Harlequins Foundation. So we are delighted to be joined by Dr. Leroy Henry and Dr. Kanisha Linton from the University of Greenwich. Uh, today's presentation will address race and ethnicity and the appropriate use of language. Our key themes are the history of the term BAME, and what inclusive language looks like, and lastly, why language is so important. Um, the presentation will last between 30 and 40 minutes, and we'll have a 15 minute Q&A at the end. So please pop any questions you have in the Q&A feature, and we'll answer those at the end of the session. Um, I think we're ready to go. So I think I'm passing over to Dr. Kanisha Linton to get us started. Thank you so much. And thanks for having us. Lira, if you could just go to the next slide for me, please. So we're gonna be talking about race and ethnicity, the appropriate use of language. I'll start off with the introductory slides and then my colleague Leroy will continue um, discussing some topics in relation to BAME and blackness. And we'll close off with some ideas on the use of appropriate terms. So uh, the, yes, thanks for the structure, Leroy. So first I'll be going through the definitions and some key, key classifications for, um, for trying to describe race and ethnicity. They will situate the, the term BAME in terms of the history of anti-racism and activism and the appropriate language there. We'll discuss criticism around the acronym BAME, explore some of the alternative language that, languages that are emerging in terms of referring to race and ethnicity, and reflect on some appropriate and less appropriate language. Next slide, Leroy. So the interest around um, tackling race and ethnic equality in society came about, um, well, it, it became prominent again after last summer's um, resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement um, in response to the murder of George Floyd. Also last summer, we went into um, deep discussions around the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on minority ethnic groups in our community. And um, this brought on a refocus on inequality and discrimination in society and different organizations have tried to make an effort to understand race and ethnicity. Um, and in trying to have the dialogue on race and ethnicity, um, the use of language has come up as an important point to address. So this is also relevant now in relation to the Sewell report that just came out that talks about the term BAME and challenges the use of that term to represent a community that isn't as um, homogenous as you think. Um, the, 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 oh, next slide for me, please, Leroy. Now, the questions around the use of the term BAME and um, what, what, what terms are best for describing um, minority ethnic groups, this can be something that's just down to semantics, but um, language that is used to, to describe something both reflects the impacts on how you understand it and also reflects the wider um, societal power structures. So it's not just about semantics, it's about how people want to be understood and labeled and um, what those labels actually mean. So we're going to go into discussions about the history of some of these terminologies that we use to describe different ethnic groups in our society, what it means and um, how it impacts our lives in society when we use certain terminologies. Next slide, Leroy. I wanted to ask you a question before we start um, and please put this in the chat. We'll look at it later, but just type in how you self-identify in terms of your ethnicity. Just whatever comes to mind, 
It might not be what the categories are on the census that we've just completed, but when you are asked about your ethnicity, what do you say? What comes to mind first when someone asks you to identify in terms of ethnicity? So just type that in the chat. We'll have a look at it later, but at least everyone will get a kind of flavor of the different ethnicities that are in this space right now and how people self-identify, not how society tells us to identify, but how you self-identify or would want to self-identify. So just leave those in the chat. I'm going to be going through it. And um, as Lira and I go through the session, we will touch on sort of the differences that we're seeing with what you're saying you identify as compared to um, how society categorize different ethnic groups. Next slide, Leroy, please. So in terms of, so while there are certain differences between race and ethnicity, the two terms are at times conflated due to possible common heritage, um, in the expression. So race is defined as a category of humankind and share certain distinctive physical traits um, such as skin color, hair texture. So um, race is a social construct. It's a categorization and it's based on our external features. That's what this definition is saying. Ethnicity is more broadly defined in terms of groups of people classed according to common racial and national and tribal and religious and linguistic traditions um, and also their cultural background. So that is also a social construct. So it pertains to cultural traits and you know, physical features again, um, as well as beliefs and practices. And neither of these concepts are fixed they are contextual, they are contested, and they change over time. So although race has no genetic basis, and same for ethnicity, it is a social concept um, that still shapes human experience. And racial bias fuels social exclusion. And so understanding you know, how we use these social constructs and how they can lead to, to um, exclusion and discrimination. It's very, very important. Um, next slide, please. I should have just taken control of your slides, Zero. So these are some classifications in terms of defining um, race and ethnicity or ethnic groups in our society. So the term black, is used um, when referring to people from African, Caribbean, South American, and South Asian descent. So these people share a common uh, racialized experience in the United Kingdom based on their skin color. And so historically, the term black was used to refer to persons from these different societies. Um, minority ethnic, is used to refer to people who are not white, not white British, nor black. Um, BME, I know many of you are probably familiar with that term or that acronym, it stands for black and minority ethnic and refers to, um, it, it, refers to it refers collectively to non-white um, people. And BAME, which is the sort of presently used along with BME, but the government uses BAME, so Black, Asian, and minority ethnic. So this term is used in the UK to refer to anyone Black, Asian, and from a minority ethnic group. And it also comprises of mixed Asian, Black, and other, so non-white ethnicities. We also have people of color. This isn't used very widely in the UK context. It's used mainly in America and it is used to describe anyone um, who is um, not considered white. Um, it has certain colonial um, past, well, historical connotations. So it's not used as widely in the UK. BIPOC, so black, indigenous and people of color is also used to describe um, persons who are not considered white. And white 
is the term used to describe white British people. So, and the groups included here would be white British, white English, I mean, white Irish, gypsy, Irish traveler and other white. Although it's important to note that sometimes the category of BAME does include white other, depending on the organization, depending on um, the, the, how they choose to classify white versus BAME. So sometimes BAME does include um, white other. Uh, next slide, Leroy, I think that's over to you now. It is, yeah. Thanks, Kanisha. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about this term BAME because it's obviously um, a very contentious term at the moment. And I wanna talk first of all about where it came from, how it evolved, and then go on to talk about some of the critiques of it, the use of BAME. So its roots are in a response to an idea that was called political blackness. So before the civil rights and um, black power movements of the 60s, nobody really used the term black. It was seen as being very negative. Even within minority ethnic communities, people didn't really call themselves black. Uh, but what happened was that in the 60s, the term black was appropriated by anti-racist activ activists in the North and anti-colonial activists in the South. Uh, things like the Black Power Movement, Black Consciousness Movement, and that really built on these struggles. And they used the term black as what we call a political organizing tool for all non-white people who were organizing against racism. And they used this term political blackness to mean that it doesn't mean that your skin's necessarily black. It means that you are consciously opposed to racism. So it brought together a range of very different groups with different histories, different identities, but who shared a common experience around racism and marginalization in the UK, and who were very conscious that they were part of a struggle against injustice and marginalization. And this was consciously linked to struggles in the South, in the global South, the anti-colonial struggles, consciously linked to political movements in the United States, the Caribbean, and it was an organizing strategy that linked African Caribbean people and South Asians in their struggles against racism in Britain in the 60s, 70s and 80s. Um, but this came under a lot of criticism uh, by the 1980s. And interestingly, a lot of these criticisms are also leveled against the use of BAME as a terminology. So the first criticism really was that it was confused in the sense that people weren't sure whether it was just focusing on people of African origins or whether it was related to all white groups. And there was a very strong argument that came from some uh, groups, some minority groups, particularly South Asians, who argued that actually they didn't self-identify as black, therefore they didn't feel comfortable being called politically black. Uh, there was also an argument which was around uh, the fact that it was the, the term black reflects a skin color and that it could be seen as legitimating theories that argued that there were such things as biological races. There was another very strong argument that came across about it artificially homogenizing disparate groups, i.e. that it's bringing all these different groups together who don't necessarily have a shared experience. And again, this is an argument that we're gonna come back to later, thinking about BAME. Um, and it was particularly focused on a lack of recognition of the different experiences of South Asians compared to African Caribbeans in the 70s and early 80s. And this became quite a big debate within academic and activist circles in the 80s and 90s. And it led to a series of demands to reject blackness as an organizing tool and find some more inclusive terminology. And the terminology that people settled on were firstly black and minority ethnic and later BAME. And those became the kind of key terminology that were used until recently, because they're seen as being much more inclusive in that you can bring in people who don't necessarily identify as black or feel excluded by the use of the term black, 
And it's also a more accurate description of the heterogeneity or difference within minority groups. So it, it has the capacity to understand that there are differences between different ethnic groups. So BAME has become the kind of default terminology that's used by the government and by organizations when collecting statistics or talking about non-white people. But it should also be noted that the government uh, still uses ethnically based characteristics, as do many organizations. So they still collect data around ethnic identity. So uh, South Asian, East, East Asian, African Caribbean, Black African, they're still using those characteristics, but quite often they're amalgamated into what we call the big five, black, Asian, white, other and mixed. And then these are further amalgamated into a dualism of BAME and white. So what's happened over the last, well, certainly over the last 10 years and very, very strongly over the last couple of years is that BAME the term BAME has become attacked on all different sides. So it's been attacked in academia, it's been attacked by anti-racist activists, and it's also been attacked by post-racial writers, so people who believe that race is no longer important. And it has very few people who are now vocally supporting the use of the term BAME. So what I wanna do now is think about some of the criticisms that have been leveled against BAME um to look at kind of why it is that people find it disempowering why people are not comfortable with it and that kind of brings us back to this original idea about the importance of language and what things are being opened up by language what experiences are being closed down by the language that we use so the most obvious criticism of BAME is that hardly anybody actually self-identifies as BAME Kanisha asked you all to put your self-identity into the text box. I'm guessing that nobody self identified Nobody said BAME, Leroy. Not, no. I just checked. Not yeah. one person said BAME. Everybody actually said either Indian British, British Caribbean, Black Caribbean, Black British, but nobody used BAME. And um, for white, we have um, white Polish, white British, um, um, and just the normal census categories in terms of white. You use. So nobody used BAME to define themselves a while ago. So that's that's interesting that nobody used it. So in um, we, there's evidence from research that very, very few people would select BAME. Um, therefore, why would we use a term to describe people if they don't actually use it themselves? Now, there is a defense against this, um, and it is that identity is contextual so that you adopt different identities at different times. So some of these things that Kanisha was talking about, if you describe yourself as South, A South Asian, that doesn't necessarily mean that you would not, in a different circumstance, identify yourself as BAME. So if you are talking about, um, and if you're trying to, if you're working with other minority ethnic groups, to try and develop a common front against racism, then there might be situations where you may identify yourself as BAME. Having said that, it's fairly clear that nobody normally identifies themselves as BAME. Um, another critique is that it still uses the term black. So all the criticisms against about using the term black can still be leveled at BAME. So is it really focusing on people of African origins or is it using black in a more political sense? And why is it that BAME is black, Asian and minority ethnic? Why is it not African, Asian and minority ethnic? Um, the way that it talks about black people and Asians, people argue that that sets these two groups apart from other ethnic groups. So does that mean that the struggles of black and Asian people are more important than the struggles of other minority ethnic groups. Uh, and there's also an argument around it setting an artificial dualism. So there's black, black and Asian people and minority ethnic people against white people. 
uh, and a process that we call othering. And I'm gonna come back to that a little bit later in more detail. And another major criticism is that it doesn't, it excludes people who don't necessarily self-identify as minority ethnic. And certainly over the last 10 to 15 years, there's been a major issue around East and Central European people who are marginalized in the workplace, um, but don't self-identify as necessarily as minority ethnic, and certainly probably not as Black, Asian and minority ethnic. So does that mean that they're not gonna get support and engage with support focusing on BAME, for example, trade union BAME workers groups? So there's, a, there's an, a major issue there. If we look back to the criticisms of political blackness around it artificially homogenizing very disparate groups, these, the same criticism can be leveled at BAME because it still indiscriminately combines people from very, very different cultural backgrounds, social backgrounds, and these backgrounds play out in different ways so that they have very different socioeconomic experiences in the UK. And what that can do is to mask differences between ethnic groups. If you take all BAME groups together, then it masks differences between these groups. So for example, I do a lot of work around ethnic pay gap calculations. Generally speaking, Chinese people and Indian people earn more than white British, Bangladeshis, African Caribbeans and Pakistanis earn considerably less. If you group all these groups together and compare them and white, it, the ethnic pay gap gets distorted and hidden. So it masks these differences. And equally importantly, it ignores inequality within white groups. So historically, white Irish people have been marginalized in Britain. It's probably less the case now, certainly in terms of wages, it's less the case. More recently, white Roma, gypsy travelers, they are one of the most, if not the most, marginalized groups in our society, yet they will be possibly captured under the BAME terminology. Similarly, BAME also hides intra-ethnic differences. So differences within racial groups or differences within ethnic groups. So for example, if you are looking at the term black um, and looking at educational attainment, there are relatively high levels of educational attainment for West Africans, uh, low levels relatively for African Caribbeans. So those differences are gonna be hidden. Similarly, there are huge differences in income between Indians, Pakistanis, and Bangladeshis. There's also a strong argument that says that using this term may well ignore other issues such as class and gender, which can make the experience of minority ethnic people very different. So for example, African Caribbean women are generally of one of the few ethnic groups that earn a lot more than African Caribbean men, for example. So a lot of these differences within class, gender, nationality can be hidden by using this terminology. A really important argument is also around this idea of an artificial dualism between white and non-white people. And the kind of two approaches to this, one, which was very clear in the recent Sewell report published by the government, and that's looking at making an argument that says if you define people by what they're not, it can lead to victimhood. So Sewell is arguing that it's demeaning to be characterized in this way, that we should characterize ourselves in ethnic terms. And he argues that if you use the term BAME, all disparities and inequalities end up being related to majority versus minority discrimination, and it presents minority ethnic people as victims. Um, I'm not convinced of any of this, to be honest. I mean, he's making two very different arguments. One is dangers around artificial homogenization, which we've just talked about, and that's not confined to BAME. And the second one is that being compared to white people is likely to be demeaning and make a sense of victimhood. Now, I think this is really, really important but not for the reasons that Sewell argues. 
there are more pressing reasons. And again, it's looking at the power relationships that are embedded in language and how we understand this terminology is a reflection of an equal power relationships in our society that shape our culture and the meanings that we attribute to different terminology. So, yep, so Sewell is correct that BAM creates this kind of artificial dualism where white people are put in one category, non-white people are put in the other. But actually, in a society that is has unequal power relationships around ethnicity, it presents white people as being normal and minority ethnic people as other. So it's a process of othering. So the use of the term BAME presents these minorities as being different. And in a society which is racist, it would see them as being inherently inferior, inherently deviant and needing to be changed. Whereas whiteness is seen as being normal, not being as an ethnic category and being unproblematic. And you can see this in Sewell's report itself because he normalizes white society and then puts minority ethnic cultures under investigation and he looks at cultural deficits. So it's, he says that white people are different from black people and the problem is in the cultural deficits of ethnic minorities and he uses a range of very crude stereotypes to, as examples. So he talks about, um, women coming from Pakistani villages being the reason for poor educational attainment in Pakistani communities and dysfunctional African Caribbean families being responsible for high levels of criminality and low educational attainment. So he's essentially taking things back to debates from the 1970s. A final uh, criticism of this language is thinking about who are the actual majorities and minorities at a global level. And you can see this little diagram here, it's quite crude, but I think it makes an important point that at a global level, white people are a very small minority, but are presented as the majority. Whereas people of color, ethnically marked people are clearly a global majority. And the language that we use here is again a reflection of power relationships. So for example, when minority ethnic people live in Britain, they're called ethnic minorities. When white people live in Asia or Africa, they're called expats. Now that is essentially a reflection of privilege. And if you're calling white people a majority, that does reinforce their privilege and it entrenches the marginality of non-white people. And it also prevents us from thinking at a global level. So that's a very quick overview of some of the criticisms that have been leveled at this with the discussion of kind of the power relationships that underpin it. Kanish is now gonna go on and talk about some of the ways that we could take this forward. Okay, so going forward, if BAME does not represent the varied experiences of minorities and um, reproduce, race-based privileges, then what better way, what better expressions can we come up with? So the question here is, is there a better way of expressing um, this without losing the collective nature of anti-racism? Um, that's a question for us to probably discuss in the Q&A section. Um, next slide, Leroy. Um, people of color and um, black and indigenous people of color are two terminologies that are gaining prominence in the UK. And historically within the UK, the use of the term colored people was associated with colonial racist attitudes, and so it was rejected. Um, people of color, although it lacks some precise conceptual clarity, has a political connotation similar to you know, black and um, in the British context, it is used to confront stigmatizing um, people with pigmentation that is different from um, pigmentation of the dominant white group. So it is a replacement of BAME um, basically. So, Persons would argue instead of using BAME, where we're pitting 
you know, black, Asian, like sort of dissecting the um, people of color category. It is this tendency to try and unite the um, group some more um, in terms of a political stance. So the, the um, use of people of color is gaining some prominence based on research. And um, then when it comes to black and indigenous people of color, this is more of a preference in the United States. So um, the, I'm just getting my arm. Um, so it's historically rooted in um, the acknowledgement of racial oppression again. And um, this terminology is, people want to, sort of associate with that. It's the solidarity again with people of color, but the indigenous side of it is where they're linking it to a specific historical context. When you think of indigenous persons in America, um, Australia, et cetera, you will find there's a tendency to use BIPOC instead of POC because they want to, to um, isolate the historical context of black and indigenous people um, in terms of um, historical oppression. This, there's a study by, um, by um, Paul McKines where he basically found that, and did, this was a study conducted in November, 2020, where he found that the term BAME offended those whom it attempted to describe and the term ethnically diverse communities came out as the top pick for persons when speaking broadly about um, minority groups. So this is something to explore. Like we have so many different categories as I had shown you in the introduction in terms of classifications for minority ethnic groups, the numbers will continue and the criticisms of every single categorization, every single um, acronym or terminology, there, there will be people who will oppose to that, um, to those terms. And this new one um, that's been proposed, ethnically diverse communities, is also just another one added to the list. Um, next slide, Leroy. So just to close off our discussion in terms of the appropriate language, um, I wanted to sort of just flag, not, not, not necessarily point fingers or hold up red cards, even though I put up the red card there, but instead of using certain terms, we could consider some more inclusive um, language when um, dealing with you know, race and ethnicity. So the main sort of guidance here is when we, we should use adjectives rather than nouns where it is important to identify someone's race. So um, instead of, I guess, um, saying the whites, you just say white people. Um, so don't say the blacks, don't say the whites. Black people, white people. Instead of saying colored people, we say other racial groups or people of color or BAME, if you, um, if you um, subscribe to that terminology. Um, don't say, well, instead of saying half caste or exotic, it is advised that you say mixed race, because I saw in the um, chat feature, persons um, describing themselves as mixed race. Um, someone put mixed race, um, Spanish, Jamaican. Um, so uh, people are happy to be identified as mixed race, biracial, multiracial people. But if you call them half caste or exotic, it's an othering that isn't considered as positive as the others. Um, minorities, in, instead of using minorities, you can say underrepresented groups, minority ethnic groups. So one of those two, but don't, 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 don't just use the word by itself, minority. 
because it can come with negative connotations. Um, minority ethnic group still has the word minority in it, and many people take offense to the word minority, but at least if you use it in, in the context of minority ethnic group, um, instead of just minority by itself, it helps um, in terms of just trying to soften the language. Foreigners, so instead of saying foreigners, say people from overseas, if you want to avoid um, the awkwardness there. Uh, if someone calls me foreigner, I tend not to have a problem with it, but maybe that's just me. So um, blacklisted, instead of saying blacklisted or white lists, you can say block list, um, safe list, allow list, a deny list, but try to avoid black and white when you are um, um, talking about lists or you know things that are banned. And as I said earlier around using adjectives in, um, um, rather than nouns, same for if you're talking about a footballer, instead of saying a black footballer, you know, if it's important to identify someone's race, okay, then go ahead and say that. But just say a footballer because nobody wants to be the black doctor or the Asian doctor. They just want to be a doctor. They, this, they're not the one representing their entire race of um, doctors or footballers or lawyers. This, if you just acknowledge them as part of the profession in, instead of um, isolating the blackness or whiteness or Asian-ness, then that is um, a good start. So those are just some inclusive language to leave you with. Um, thank you very much. Last slide. You can contact us if you have any questions, um, but the chat is here where I see just one question for now. So it's opening up now for Q&A. Thank you all for your attention. Leroy, Kanisha, thank you so much. Um, really, really interesting information, which I think has a lot of value to so many people on the call. Um, as Kanisha just said, uh, it would be wonderful to have some more questions in the Q&A. Uh, we'll start with a uh, question that Samina's put through, is asking about the term dual heritage. So I'm unsure which one of you would like to tackle that one, but sort of sort of terminology relation to those who identify dual heritage or biracial and sort of your um, guidance on that language. Oh, Leroy, okay, I'll just take that one. Okay. I, I noticed in the, um, in the chat earlier, there were persons who actually identified dual heritage. So it's someone said that they're second generation Jamaican. And, and, and that's important, like the, it's, it's so important to, instead of labeling someone as, okay, black or BAME, but finding out from them how they would want to be described. And which is why in the beginning I said, how do you self-identify? Because someone would look at me and call me BAME, but I'd say, no, sorry, I'm Jamaican British because I identify as a naturalized British as well as the fact that I am Jamaican, first and foremost, I'm Jamaican. So that um, dual heritage is something that I subscribe to in terms of using that. Leroy, is it something that you support? Yeah, I mean, I feel more, there are problems with it, but I feel more comfortable with the terminology dual heritage than I do with mixed race, definitely. Um, I think heritage kind of captures the cultural side and the historical side of things. Uh, there are problems with it in the sense that a lot of people are more than dual heritage, they're multiple heritage. Mm -hmm. And certainly as you're Jamaican, Jamaica is a melting pot of all sorts of ethnicities and backgrounds. Yeah. Uh, and that does relate to Samina's question around this idea of pure races um, and using the term race for anything, from my perspective, for anything other than an organizing principle, I don't feel entirely comfortable with it. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't certainly call myself mixed race. I call myself mixed heritage. It's interesting because someone just, just, just commented that the term mixed race gives off this feeling that there is a pure race. 
and there isn't a pure race like every one of us is mixed with something so we're all mixed race essentially so how how much is the mixture is it one percent five percent fifty percent you know but we're yeah. all mixed so it's it's the idea that there is a pure race and nobody likes to be seen as different because they're mixed so yeah, yeah dual absolutely. heritage yeah yeah, I feel much more comfortable with that because to, if you're using race in any way that legitimates it as a biological notion is really dangerous. And I think calling yourself mixed race comes quite close to legitimating ideas of race being anything other than a social construct. Yeah. Great. Now, thank you very much for, for answering that. We have a question from, from Simon. Um, relating to some significant language differences between um, terminology here in the UK and in the US. Um, I myself spent three years working in the US and they do approach language in regards to diversity and inclusion very differently than we do. Um, can either of you speak to your experience in relating to those differences? Go on, Leroy. I was just about to invite you to do that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not that familiar with, with uh, the US. But there's obviously there are kind of similarities and there are differences. So there's long synergies that go on um, within what Gilroy calls the Black Atlantic. So there's interactions between the UK, West Africa, the Caribbean and the United States in terms of constructing language and constructing struggles against uh, racial oppression. And so there are a lot of similarities there, but there are also differences historically as well, which play out in the sorts of terminology and language that people use. So some of the language in the United States, I think people in the UK are less comfortable with. So the idea of people of color, I think has probably got more traction in the States than it does in Britain, where this idea of the colored was maybe not a term of abuse, but it certainly wasn't a, a way that anybody in the 60s and 70s self-identified. It was a way that we were identified as being an other and inferior. So there is definitely a, a difference in language there. And obviously the idea of BIPOC makes no sense in the UK. If you talk about the indigenous, well, unless you're trying to bring in Irish and Welsh people who I think are the indigenous British people, then it, it doesn't make a great deal of sense in the UK. Mm. Great, thank you. Kanisha, do you have anything further you want to add on that topic? No, I think Leroy covered everything there. I was going to say something about the prominence in the use of African American, Asian American, and it's the sort of using the national um, heritage as a way of identifying people, but we don't use that here in, in the UK. Um, that's one major difference that I've noticed. Yeah, no, I definitely would agree with you on that one. Um, we have another question from um, someone who is listed as anonymous. Um, what do you think about using black and brown instead of BAME? Um, as white people have described as such, I've taken to using black and brown. It shows um, how ridiculous the disparities and discrimination are. Um, what, are your, sort of, what are your comments on that? Um, from my perspective, it's it's it's, part, it's mostly about how people self-identify. And if people self-identify as brown, then I guess that's fine. But it's I'm not sure it's going to take things any further forward than just using black. I'm not quite sure why having us using a slightly lighter skin tone as a description is going to be that helpful. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I think we have another question through from Andrew Day. Um, does the culturally constructed nature of race and ethnicity make them somewhat exploitable? For example, as Amaphobes say, they are attacking a religion and not a race. Um, what are your thoughts on, on that? Oh, you just deleted it. I was actually oh, yeah, reading the question. Reading, I was just reading that. Okay. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, it's, it means that it's fluid and it means that so there are very fluid boundaries between race, race and, ethnicity. and ethnicity and religion. And 
yes, it is. It it doesn't give people an excuse if they're saying no. We're just talking about religion because it is. It's using the similar sorts of language, similar sorts of levels of oppression that have been leveled against, for for instance, in the UK, the Pakistani and Bangladeshi communities, um, using ethnicity, culture, religion, all brought together. So it's very difficult to disentangle th these different strands. Yeah. I had an example from, um, there was a conference I attended and a lady, she did a study where um she's she's it wasn't a study oh she was just talking about her experience it was more of a sort of biographical so she was telling her story around turning up to work because she, she's from a um, muslim background and um she isn't she she decided to try out wearing her i mean not wearing her hijab to um work and noticing how people treated her because she could pass as white based on how she looks or mediterranean and um she she said she um she wasn't much she anyways she did this trial where she went to work with a hijab went to work without one and she did it several times and over time she was like this is it's very distinct how I'm treated very differently when I wear a hijab compared to when I'm just seen as a normal white woman. Um, and she was able to distinguish the differences in treatment, attitudes, just how everybody treated her um, in terms of her ethnicity being very visible versus being invisible. And um, that just came to mind when, when he asked about religion because she used that little trial and told about her, I mean, and spoke of her experience there, that there was a difference in how she was treated at work. And that's interesting, because that's not just religion, that's also just some of the other cultural things that go with ethnicity. So a piece of research I did, I remember interviewing a woman, an Asian woman who said that she was treated very differently if she came into work wearing jeans, or if she came into work wearing more traditional clothes, mm -hmm. that she'd be, acknowledged and engaged with and the appearance would be commented upon if she was wearing jeans and if she's wearing traditional Asian clothes she'd just be ignored. Mm. Yeah. And it's just the whole inclusion exclusion and how visible signs of difference makes people just automatically treat you differently and exclude you. So she she did speak about the feelings of exclusion and just the general politeness that people had towards her became very neutral, like they'd rather not interact with you at all. So it's not that people were negative towards her, there just was a um, noticeable reduction in the amount of interaction with her. So she was excluded, basically. No, I think that example, Kanisha, is a very a vivid one in relation to sort of visible expression versus mm -hmm. not and just the yeah. impact that I can have in social settings. Um, yeah. so I think that's a really useful example for everyone to, to hear. Um, we have another question in relation to terminology. Andrew is asking if the uh, McInnes terminology of um, ethnically diverse communities um, is the best terminology at present um, to replace BAME. <laughs> no, <laughs> that was just, that was just um that was just an uh, it was a study that it, it was a research that was carried out in November and it was discussed in the Guardian, just like that that Twitter poll with seven thousand people asking them if they want to use BAME or not. Um, this is just a kind of testing the public perception of these terminologies. So, ethnically diverse communities that came out as the top suggestion from persons to replace BAME but I don't think it's representative of what the BAME community thinks or wants. It's not, no, it's I'm, not a, it's the, the sample size I don't think is big enough. No, I'm not entirely sure what that means, to be honest. Yeah, and it's so vague, yeah, it's ethically so diverse community. It's so you know? In terms of terminology, I think it's, it's contextual and it depends what you're trying to achieve by using the terminology. If you're looking at, specific issues like an ethnic pay gap 
then it would make sense to use ethnic groups because that's the easy, most granular approach. If you're looking at the collective marginalization of different groups, then you could talk about marginalized ethnic groups. Yeah. But ethnically diverse communities, it, I don't know what that means. It's too vague. It what is. does that mean? I live in an ethnically diverse community. There's black people, white people, Asian people, but I don't think that's what it means. I don't know. Exactly. And that was just to flag up in terms of going forward with all this debate about what terminologies to use and what acronyms represent me and describe me appropriately. People are just constantly coming up with new ways of saying, OK, this is more appropriate if that isn't. And this one just makes it even more obscure as far as I'm concerned. Oh, great, thank you both. I think we've got a final two questions before we we finish. Um, Simon asks, what are your thoughts about how terminology might change in the next 10 years? I think your presentation really did go into the fluidity and the change of language over the last mm -hmm. 50 years or so. And they've mentioned you know, political changes, global power shifting, increased sort of um, sort of varied ethnicities. What, um, what are your thoughts about what might come down the line? I guess that's hard to predict, but still, what are your things about what, what, what sort of the next 10 years might look like? I mean, it, it's, hard to, it's hard to judge other than, I mean, there's clearly, as you said, there's global power shifting going on, which would probably mean that this idea of ethnic majority, ethnic minorities, is becoming increasingly meaningless yeah. in terms of difference in global power. And certainly if we're being influenced by things going on in the States, then I think the white community is probably going to become a numerical minority even within the States, which would mean that that language becomes increasingly meaningless. But it's very difficult to know. Um, maybe even a, a year ago, would we have predicted what happened with George Floyd's murder and how that's shifted debate so far. So it's very difficult to know, but I think it will be more nuanced, more granular, looking hopefully more contextual and purpose-driven. And I think, as you said, the everything is constantly changing and we have to continue yeah. to evaluate. And I think those who sort of say, I can't keep up, I mean, granted, our world is changing across all spectrums. So that will obviously have a key impact on language as well. Um, so thank you for that, Leroy. Um, we'll finish on this last question. Uh, apologies if we haven't got to everyone. I know that some people put some questions in the chat, um, but uh, Matt Webb from the King Cross Steelers, um, I'm asking new members um, to a rugby club, for example, to identify a good list of terms to use, potentially using the census options as to be the most inclusive way in regards to identity regard, in relation to ethnic background? What are your sort of little bits of advice for, for Matt? Uh, it would depend what you're trying to achieve. If you're trying to broad, diversify the rugby club, which I assume is what you're trying to do, then uh, yeah, I think the census options would be the most logical approach to take. So you can kind of capture the diversity of your organization and then you've got a rep you can then use that again as a reference point, like the census, uh, census data in your locality, and you can look at the extent to which your organization is reflecting the wider diversity within that community, within that geographical area. Wonderful. Um, Kanisha, do you have anything you want to add to that? Um, no, I think that covers it in terms of, well, my view is that you should always still ask people how they prefer to be identified, because as much as on the census I put Black British, I don't want people to call me Black British, I'm Jamaican, so. <laughs> and as you said, just ask the question and to... to and yeah, to, if it's for formal, you know, organizational reasons, yeah, put me down as Black British. But if it's to talk in a social organizational setting and people identifying their heritage and so on, I'd say I'm Jamaican. Great, thank you. I'm conscious there were some questions put through in the chat. I wanted to try and get as, uh, as many of the questions answered, but obviously not running over time. Um, I think this morning has been incredibly valuable. Thank you so much for your time and for sharing your expertise.
Um, I think it's fair to say if you've listed your, your emails up there, I guess if anyone have any specific questions relating to today's content, um, I hope you'll both be open to people reaching out to you to asking those questions, yeah. um, which, which would be fantastic. Um, we will also try and share some resources after this to um, everyone who signed up, because I think today is going to be a very valuable resource for people to reflect on. Um, so as I said, on behalf of the Harlequins Foundation, thank you to everyone who has listened this morning. But again, a very special thank you to Dr. Leroy Henry and Dr. Kanisha Linton um, for this morning. Just in, yeah, very, very valuable insight and knowledge. So thank you both for your time. Um, I will send through a recording um, of today's webinar to everyone um, and send some resources. And I'd also love you if you could all fill out our post event survey. This helps us uh, move forward of our planning. Um, so once again, thank you so much for your time today to you both. Um, thank you to everyone for joining. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at future Harlequins Foundations events. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Bye. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.